Can you hear me in the back? I'm trying to figure out how close I need to be to the mic. Okay, I'll try to stay in a little bit close, but when I get carried away, I might not. Um, I'm really honored to be here this morning and invited to speak to this group. In my talk, I'll mention a little bit about history of peeps. But you know, we're on the cutting edge of history every day as we move forward. And today, we're all making history by being at this meeting. This is the inaugural meeting of a new society. And if you're as excited as I am, well, that's appropriate. Um, the talk I'm about to give is, can we reach consensus about PEEP? Um, looking out at this audience, I predicted before I even put this talk together that I'd be looking at a group of people that know more about PEEP than I do. Well, that's could be intimidating. So I decided I will just present today what I don't know about people. So this uh, presentation, there's no point in me trying to describe exactly what PEEP is and what it's doing, because everybody here understands it. So I'm going to run through kind of a macro look at PEEP and think about what I don't know and perhaps what you don't know and uh, take a look at it from that point of view. So it might be a little editorial, and I tend to get a little sarcastic, so forgive me for that. But I don't purposely put out misinformation. So that being said, let's move forward. Well, these are the objectives for this presentation. Uh, you can don't need to look at that too long. Um, Back in about April or May, I did an online Google search for positive inspiratory pressure. Now, not peep, not like birds peeping or those little marshmallows, but positive inspiratory pressure. I got almost 10 million results in less than one second. So there's a lot of information out there about peep. Now, I apologize, I did not review all of these articles. Uh, and I will put a footnote, I'm primarily talking about the use of PEEP in ARDS. And I often think about the difficult patients that we have more than the easy ones. Um, if you're not familiar with the Cochrane Review, I just wanted to bring this up. The Cochrane Review is a library in uh, England where they do very nice reviews of literature on all sorts of questions. They had 67 reviews regarding positive inspiratory pressure. And again, extremely valuable tool if you don't use it. I'm a little disappointed in their recent review on the use of face masks, but we'll let that slide. So what's the deal with coming to consensus on peak? I sat down and I started thinking, what are the independent variables? What are the things that when we set up peak that we can change that affect? And you can see a whole list of about 10, uh, 10 or 12, 13 things there. Um, everything from actually where we set the peak to the patient's body position. Uh, on the other side, what are the dependent variables? When we set up peak, what kinds of things can become outcome variables or dependent variables? And um, that's a whole long list too. So when you think about studying peak or even using peak clinically, uh, you almost have to use multivariate analysis figure out what you're doing if you're really going to look clearly at what's been what's going on and I don't know that anyone's really I don't know of any heat studies that have used multivariate analysis okay so just for fun let's look at one very obscure independent variable for heat the heat valve resistance so this is a slide from a long time ago that's the ventilator circuit up there, and the, the top of the circuit is the exhaust limb. And you can see the exhaust, after the exhaust valve is hooked to a, a tube that goes down into a plexiglass container filled with water. So to generate PEEP, you can just fill up the water to whatever level you want, and the ventilator, uh, the exhalation will kind of bubble out. Uh, I was doing respiratory care before we were really using PEEP. It hadn't gotten popular. And so we didn't have any PEEP valves. We didn't even have any little plexiglass things. So what we would do is take a rubbish can, a uh, wastebasket, and put a weight around the 
exhalation, a hose off the exhalation and throw it in the waste basket and it would sink to the bottom. And then we'd add the water up to whatever centimeters of water peep we had, which it actually worked pretty well. Uh, however, it kind of inadvertently gave percussive therapy at the same time. And invariably someone would start throwing rubbish in the rubbish can, so you had to kind of keep an eye on it. However, uh, Jack Emerson of the Emerson Company came up with a very nice water peep column and made it a lot easier and people didn't throw rubbish in it. So uh, that has a pretty wide valve and didn't have a lot of expiratory resistance pushing back against the patient's exhalation, but still generating peep. In more modern times, similar valves of large surface area and low resistance have been used on mechanical ventilators. Uh, this is another PEEP device. Now you'll see these stuck on uh, hand resuscitation bags, or you know you might see them also on the uh, other other ventilators that are usually um, less expensive. Now what I'd like to mention down here, you see on the footnote there. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a study by Marini back in 1985, uh, where he and his group looked at the resistance of exhalation valves because it's important, but we don't really think about it that much. You know, I'd be willing to bet that if I asked most people in this audience what the resistance of the exhalation valve on the ventilator they most commonly use it, you wouldn't know specifically and might not even have a wild idea. But I'm not gonna do that. Uh, so the last slide on this, this particular digression into one of the variables about PEEP is, you know, your modern ventilators. Now there's all kind of ventilators out here in the hall. Um, what kind of a PEEP valve do they have? So this is uh, off of one of the ventilators here. I, I don't know what the resistance of this PEEP valve is, but it's a commonly used uh, new modern ventilator. And if I were using it, I'd probably want to know that. On the other side is a disposable PEEP valve and if you're using inexpensive ventilators where you're using disposable circuits on them, some of these valves are really actually quite horrible. You know, some of them are all right, but uh, it's something that we might want to know about. Okay, well, off of that digression, um, <laughs> I don't expect you to read this slide, okay? I, I just put it up there because this is, I think, the latest on peak. Uh, recommendation clinical practice guideline for mechanical ventilation in adults with ARDS. And so uh, I thought, well, you know, I should at least, we should at least have a look at that. So what they're recommending is, and I quote, we suggest that adult patients with moderate or severe ARDS receive higher rather than lower levels of PEEP. Doesn't give us any numbers there. This is a conditional recommendation, which doesn't mean this is the absolute truth. It means maybe this is true. In fact, most likely it's true. And so it's a, a moderate competence in effect estimate. And this was actually based on a paper that looked, it looked to me like at least. It's a meta-analysis of, uh, it was actually around 3,000 patients, but 1,892 of them had ARDS. And among the patients with the higher peak group, 34% of them uh, died. And with the lower peak group, 39%. And that was statistically significant. You can see a p-value of 0 0.041 there. So um, I think we can agree it's probably better to use more peak than less peak in general terms. So what do we think we know? Well, I thought I knew that we want to use physiologic peak. So put five to eight centimeters of peak on everybody that's on a ventilator just about, just to keep their airways open. I mean, we have all kinds of beliefs around this. However, Tobin in 2012 uh, tried to explode that. He said, we really don't have evidence for that. 
mean, we can go ahead and believe it and use it and probably not harm anybody, maybe do them good. I don't know that I know that anymore. Uh, early PEEP. You know, from the beginning using PEEP, way back many, many years ago, we thought if we could see someone was likely to go into ARDS or starting to go into ARDS, maybe it's better to get the PEEP on up front rather than later. Well, this group here, uh, they found, now this is in 1984. So this is a long time ago. The early application of PEEP at eight centimeters of water on high-risk patients had no effect on the incidence of ARDS or associated complications. So, you know, maybe that's, maybe we don't know that either. Now, don't interrupt the PEEP, you know, particularly in high-level PEEP. So you've got somebody in the ICU, they're on 20, 30 of PEEP, and they're really super sick, 100% oxygen, everything in the world's wrong with them, and you disconnect the ventilator for some reason or suction them, and everything goes south. I don't know where that statement came from. There's nothing the matter with the south. Maybe it went east or west. But anyway, um, you know, I can't really find much in the literature about that, but I do know that, um, yeah, it's a point. Here which button it pushes. Yeah. You guys see that little dot? Uh, so I just don't know about this, but I certainly don't want to interrupt the high level people on any patients I'm working with. And you probably don't either. I don't know that we really have a lot of evidence to support that. Okay, so talking about what we don't know, I just wanted to use another example having to do with mechanical ventilation. And that is, that is a spontaneous breathing problem. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a consensus worldwide and certainly in this country that spontaneous breathing trial is the best method of weaning people off ventilators in terms of the things that we've come up with to wean people off ventilators. Um, however, I would submit this. Let's say you're doing spontaneous breathing trial. I think it's usually done around five, six, seven o'clock in the morning. Patients taken off the ventilator, put on something that simulates spontaneous breathing, and then you see how they do. Well, what are we doing there? Well, basically, we're asking the patient, uh, can you breathe? So we don't know whether they can or not. We're asking the patient to tell us. So this is a quote from myself here. As long as spontaneous breathing trial is the way for us to know if a patient is ready come off the ventilator, I think we have to admit we really don't know what we're doing. Let's say we at 9 o'clock in the morning. What if they were really ready to be extubated at 4 o'clock or midnight the night before or 10 o'clock? Or how about 11 o'clock in the morning the day before? So they end up sticking on the ventilator for another 20 hours because we don't know what we're doing. And I don't say that to disparage spontaneous breathing trial. I do really believe it's the best we've got at this time, unless you just want to ask the ICU nurse, and they'll tell you whether you can activate the patient or not. Uh, but anyway, I'm trying to promote some skepticism here. Okay, I'm going to do a brief history of people. I'm going to run through this quickly. Probably the earliest thing I can find is in 1938, a guy named Barish or Barrick, Alvin Barish. He was amazing. Uh, physician uh, found that uh, continuous positive pressure uh, respiration helped with pulmonary edema. So that's cool, and I think we kind of believe that at, at this time, but PEEP was really not popularized uh, until Ashbaugh and Petty. You know, and it's funny, we always say Ashbaugh and Petty, but what about Bigelow and Levine? Anyways, uh, they studied 12 patients, and they put them on PEEP, and they found that it appeared to have value for ARDS, and so this study is such a classic. I mean, it really defined PEEP and ARDS, which is called adult respiratory distress syndrome at that time. Uh, it was really, and still is a very classic article uh, based on 12 patients. Uh, along comes Gregory a few years later. He's uh, working with uh, neonates, I believe, and he was using this thing called CPAP and I think at that time he was probably using a form of spontaneous breathing with a lot of his patients 
who are on ventilators. And so CPAP has become a name for people when people are breathing spontaneously at the same time they're getting the uh, expiratory pressure. You know, I threw this uh, high peep thing in uh, with John Downs. It's often left out of the peep conversation, but I do it because I'm totally biased. I worked on his team at that time, and it was a really exciting time to work with ventilators. But um, the thing about this study, and let me see if I can see what I wrote down over here for Pete's sake. Um, I think there were 50 some patients, uh, 54, and 43 of them survived. And that gave about a 80% um, survival rate for those very sick, all those patients actually qualified for ECMO uh, back in the day. So 80% survival rate uh, with ARDS is actually uh, very high even compared to what people are saying should be the survival rate for ARDS at this time. Uh, you can't think about PEEP without thinking about auto PEEP, intrinsic PEEP, or call PEEP. Marini and his group came up with this way back in 1982 and we began paying attention to the PEEP that we were creating and we couldn't really see on the ventilator. Uh, needless to say, that kind of goes back to his looking at expiratory valve resistance doesn't it, if you think about it. They, they must have been thinking about those kind of things at the same time. Um, I think we can agree that when we find auto peep, we need to eliminate it and, and get it out of the equation unless you're dealing with a system where you want to peep the patient, don't want to do it yourself. Um, of course, the flow time curve on ventilator graphics has been a great help in identifying uh, inadvertent peep or auto peep if the ventilator doesn't measure it itself. And I would caution that when ventilators measure auto peep, it's good to check, because that's not a, a, a perfect science yet, but it is awfully helpful. Uh, then Gattinoni and his folks in Italy um, started showing us what people was really doing in the lung by using CT scans. And then at the bottom, APRV, you might think that's a mode of ventilation, which it is, but it's really just putting PEEP on the patient all the time and periodically releasing it to let the delta P give the person a breath. So I threw that into the history of PEEP. But the thing, and then the open lung concept came out around 92, 93. I put two or three authors there because I'm not sure exactly who came up with that first, but it was really a pretty exciting time when this first started hitting the literature that we could, um, you know, recruit lung and hold it open with PEEP. Now, you can't talk about PEEP without talking about the ARSNET network. So this was probably the biggest, largest study ever done on mechanical ventilation in the world, I, I suspect. I don't know that. Control and has ARDS. I'm not sure it can be generalized much beyond that, although generally people do. Um, I wanted to throw up this thing about PEEP from the ARDSNET study. This is used all over the place, and I find it very interesting. Uh, you know, there's a fair, they had a huge study, but let's look at low PEEP versus higher FO2, higher PEEP versus lower FO2. Look, they both start at 0, at 30% uh, oxygen, 5 of PEEP, both of them. They both end at 100% oxygen, 24 of PEEP. I don't know that there's any difference. So there's one of those things I don't know again. But, you know, I think if you like PEEP, well, then you can use the higher one. And if you like oxygen, you can use the higher oxygen one. So it's interesting. And then, of course, now we have ventilators that titrate the PEEP for us. So I think only Hamilton has them worldwide, and it's not yet available in the USA. But that's an exciting potential for the future. Okay, so let's say what's beyond the ARGENET protocol or whatever else we're doing. You know, what happens to a ventilator patient when we're ventilating them to the max that we can and we can't go, we can't do anymore? Well, we call it permissive hypercapnia. Well, what happens when we get in the same boat with the patient's oxygenation? You know, we're going to call that permissive hypoxia. I haven't heard that yet but it's an interesting idea. Probably we'll have to stick with palliative care. Okay, so I just put these all down here, optimal PEEP, and I think Dr. Diode 
through a couple more that should be in this list, but there's a lot of different ways we've decided to optimize, figured we could optimize PEEP. And my suggestion here is, since I don't really know, is that some combination of these that you actually understand is probably the best way to go. So in conclusion, I would suggest that clinicians do the following. Number one, understand as much about pulmonary physiology and mechanics as possible. Dr. Dowd's uh, presentation was remarkable in that respect. Measure and calculate shunts and dead space ventilation. A lot of people don't even think about those kinds of things when patients are on ventilators. Measure and think about the patient's lung compliance and expiratory resistance. Those are all easy things to do if you choose to do them and implement ventilator management quality control projects. Length of stay, if nothing else. If you don't know the length of stay in your ICU or your hospital on ventilator patients, I suggest that you're not doing good quality control. Now, that's kind of radical, but you know, I don't know. Uh, do, if you have enough resources, purchase excellent ventilators and use advanced features. You know, it's a, it's a sin to go out and pay $40,000, $50,000 for a ventilator and use it like a $1,200 ventilator. Um, consider using APRV as a, as a preferred mode of ventilation rather than a last ditch effort. And more than anything, I ask you to stand next to the bed, critically think, focus on the ventilator, patient interface, look at the patient, look at their chest, look at their face, look at the ventilator and think. Um, finally, use automation wisely and whenever possible. I think automation is really going to be our future in mechanical ventilation, but we may hear about that later. If not, if you don't want to do these things, I suggest you just follow the ArgeNet protocol or buy an automated ventilator, because then you've got a standard of practice that you're following, and you don't need to make excuses to anybody, or you've got a ventilator that has been approved by the FDA and ventilator company can take responsibility if something doesn't work out exactly the way somebody thought it ought to. So with that, I am very scared to open it up for questions. So the answer to my question is we can't, we haven't reached it. Well, I don't know, but to respond to your question, uh, the, the question was, you know, the five of PEEP, the five of PEEP, somebody on just because that logic PEEP we call it or the thing to do. You know, where did that number come from? Is it just arbitrary? Well, I think it probably is. I mean, correct me if anyone knows where that might have come from, but. Uh, I think that Mark, that's that's I'll go with that. Yeah, because we have five fingers. Questions? It's dangerous to ask a question when I tell you I don't know anything. All right. Yes, sir. I suspect there are. You know. Um, I mean, you think about patients without ARDS that are on ventilators, they might be on for a very short time, a post-operative cardiac patient who may have a very fragile heart, or, you know, maybe it's an overdose patient that's already been given the reversal and they're going to be off the ventilator in a few minutes. I think it's entirely possible to use PEEP, although I will admit as a clinician, if I was setting up a ventilator and I had a Z border, I got concerned about it. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the question was, what if, what patients might we, non-ARDS patients, might we start on zero PEEP? And uh, one of the answers is asthma patients. Yes, sir.
No, actually, we were using IMV exclusively, and we were lose, using very high tidal volumes. And I think the thing it was, it was a very unique collection of a team that really worked closely together with protocols, and people were actually looking in those days without the kinds of equipment to very in-depth physiologic, uh, pulmonary physiology and mechanics. And so I think it was a, a unique team. And I don't think those studies were able to be reproduced often because people either wouldn't use IMV or wouldn't use large tidal volumes, or they maybe didn't look as deeply at things like transpulmonary pressure as we were looking at. So I will admit we'd used a few more chest tubes than uh, is normally accessible, uh, acceptable these days, but I don't know that anyone had died from getting a chest tube in those days. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. The neonatal people started using IMV in the late 60s. A question in the back? Thank you for thank you for offering that example. Uh, I think also the radical thing to do would be to keep the chest tubes also, but you don't see that happen often. Um, that's the end of my talk here. I really thank you for your attention, um, and remember we're making history today.